Freeing yourself was one thing, claiming ownership of that freed self was another. Chloe Ardelia Wolford was born on February 18, 1931, in Lorraine, Ohio, as the second of four children to Rama Willis and George Wolford. Rama Willis Wolford was born in Greenville, Alabama, and George Morrison was born in Cartersville, Georgia. However, due to the unrelenting racism of the South, both families ended up moving north in the hope of finding much improved employment opportunities. When he was 15 years old, George Morrison witnessed the lynching of two black businessmen who happened to live in his neighborhood. Morrison recalled her father's traumatic experience, saying that he never told us that he'd seen bodies, but he had seen them. And that was too traumatic, I think, for him. Morrison later stated that her father grew to hate whites to the point that he would not allow them in the house. As a result of her father's experiences, Morrison also learned to distrust white people almost entirely. The steel mill town of Lorraine, Ohio, was home to many Hispanics, African Americans, and European immigrants. And this would prove to be Morrison's first experience in an almost entirely integrated community. Her family was, as Morrison said, intimate with the supernatural, and her childhood home was filled with the ghost stories, traditional African-American folk tales, and songs. Morrison's parents instilled a love of heritage and language through storytelling, which later on inspired Morrison to use her childhood memories to begin writing. It comes, unadorned, like a phrase strong enough to cast a spell. It comes unbidden, like the turn of sun through hills, or stars in wheels of song. The jeweled feet of women dance the earth, arousing it to spring. Shoulders broad as a road bend to share the weight of years. Profiles breach the distance and lean toward an ordinary kiss. Bliss. It comes naked into the world like a charm. Hi, Nicole here, bassoonist with the Agalois Collective. Next, Sarah Jade and I will be performing Laconian Loops after Uti Varhagi by Daniel Bernard Romain. It was commissioned by the bassoonist Lacolian Washington for he and his wife, a Swedish clarinet player. This piece was inspired by the Swedish folk song Uti Varhagi, or Out in Our Meadow, and it is considered to be a Swedish national treasure. The piece starts with the loop, heard in the vibraphone, and it becomes manipulated as the folk song melody is gradually introduced by the bassoon and clarinet. We chose to perform this piece in honor of Toni Morrison because its pastoral core shows a reverence for nature, as does Morrison with her treatment of nature throughout her literary career. Thanks for tuning in. Here's Lacoli and Loops.
In 1949, after graduating with honors from Lorraine High School, Morrison moved to Washington, D.C. to attend Howard University, one of the nation's most prestigious historically black universities. At Howard, Morrison was part of a community of black intellectuals, unlike anyone she knew while growing up in Ohio. Yet however intellectual her companions were, they struggled to pronounce her name Chloe, which caused her to adopt the nickname Tony. Morrison thrived in and out of the classroom. She earned a minor in classics, pursued theater arts and modern dance, and was a member of the sorority Alpha Kappa Alpha. Yet it was also during her years at Howard when Morrison experienced racism in ways unlike she felt in her racially integrated hometown. D.C.'s public businesses and transportation were segregated, and even on an all-black college campus, she experienced the tensions of color hierarchy that deemed lighter brown skin tones more attractive than darker ones. The Perfect Ease of Grain Time enough to spill the flavor of a woman carried through the rain. Honey talk tongues, down home dreams, a rushed by shapely prayer. Evening lips part to hush, questions raised at dawn. The melon yields another slice, fingers understand. Ecstasy becomes us all, red cherries become jam. Deep juvenile sleep, a whistle trace, white shorelines and green air, welcome doors held open when goodbye is so long. The perfect poise of grain, time enough to spill, the flavor of a woman remembered on a train. Morrison graduated with a bachelor's degree in English in 1953 and went on to earn her master's degree in American literature from Cornell University in 1955. After graduating, she taught English for two years at Houston's Texas Southern University, another HBCU, before returning to Howard as faculty member in 1957. While teaching at Howard, Morrison joined a fiction writing workshop with demanding requirements. As one of her assignments, Morrison wrote about a young black girl who desires blue eyes, which would later become her first novel. Adults, older girls, shops, magazines, newspapers, window signs, all the world had agreed that a blue-eyed, yellow-haired, pink-skinned doll was what every girl child treasured. Love is never any better than the lover. Wicked people love wickedly, violent people love violently, weak people love weakly, stupid people love stupidly, but the love of a free man is never safe. There is no gift for the beloved. The lover alone possesses his gift of love. The loved one is shorn, neutralized, frozen in the glare of the lover's inward eye. The distaste must be for her, her blackness. All things in her are flux and anticipation. But her blackness is static and dread. And it is the blackness that accounts for, that creates, the vacuum edged with distaste in white eyes. Throughout her career, Morrison published 11 novels and numerous other writings, including children's literature, nonfiction, poetry, and theater works. Her writing is known for giving a voice to the underrepresented Black community and bringing to light the painful complexities of their everyday life. She told these stories in a language that was both intellectual and artistic, and that could be both critically examined and heartfully adored by all readers. Prior to becoming a full-time author, Morrison worked as an editor for Random House Publishing from 1965 to 1983 where she was the company's first black woman to hold a senior editor position in the fiction department. As editor, Morrison prioritized publishing black authors with the goal of developing a canon of black works. Her authors included Angela Davis, Gail Jones, and Muhammad Ali. In 1974, she published a nonfiction work called The Black Book that told stories of African-American history over three centuries. While researching for this work, Morrison came across the tragic story of a slave named Margaret Garner, who would later be the subject of Morrison's best-known novel, Beloved. White people believed that whatever the manners 
Under every dark skin was a jungle. Swift, unnavigable waters, swinging, screaming baboons, sleeping snakes, red gums ready for their sweet white blood. In a way, he thought they were right. The more colored people spent their strength trying to convince them of how gentle they were, how clever and loving, how human. The more they used themselves out to persuade whites of something Negroes believed could not be questioned, the deeper and more tangled the jungle grew inside. But it wasn't the jungle blacks brought with them to this place from the other, livable place. It was the jungle white folks planted in them, and it grew. It spread in, through, and after life. It spread until it invaded the whites who had made it. Touched them, everyone. Changed and altered them. Made them bloody, silly, worse than even they wanted to be. So scared were they of the jungle they had made. The screaming baboon lived under their own white skin. The red gums were their own. In her spare time between working and publishing and raising two children as a single mother in New York, Morrison published her first novel, The Bluest Eye, in 1970. Throughout the story, blackness equates with ugliness, while whiteness equates with purity. During the decade that followed, she published Sula in 1973, which was nominated for the National Book Award, Song of Solomon in 1977, which received the National Book Critics Circle Award, and Tar Baby in 1981, whose publication was featured as a cover story for Newsweek. Her most acclaimed work, Beloved, in 1987, told of Margaret Garner's journey as a fugitive slave and the heartbreaking decision to kill her daughter rather than to see her live a life in bondage. When Beloved did not receive the National Book Award, numerous Black authors, including esteemed figures such as Maya Angelou and Alice Walker, spoke out in protest. Their voices carried, and in 1988, Beloved was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. In 1998, Beloved was turned into a film, and in 2005, the novel's protagonist became the title heroine in Richard Daniel Poor's opera, Margaret Garner, for which Morrison wrote the libretto. During the 90s and 2000s, Morrison published six more novels, including Jazz in 1992 and Paradise in 1997, which were intended to be read with Beloved as a trilogy. She received numerous awards and recognitions, including the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1993, National Humanities Medal in 2000, Honorary Doctorate from University of Oxford in 2005, and Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama in 2012. From 1997 to 2003, she served as professor at large at Cornell University, and from 1989 to 2006, Morrison held the Robert F. Goheen Chair in the Humanities at Princeton University. In recognition of all her achievements, the Toni Morrison Society formed in 1983 in order to promote further discussion and research of her writing. Hello, I'm Tori Marrera, and I will be performing Mystery and Fear for Solo Flute by Sarah Jordan. In the words of Toni Morrison, there is no room for fear. Rather, we speak, we write, and we do language, for that is how civilizations heal. This work explores that perseverance through our personal fears into ultimate triumph. I hope you enjoy.
I am not seaworthy. Look how the fish mistake my hair for home. I had a life like you. I shouldn't be riding the sea. I am not seaworthy. Let me be earthbound, star fixed, mixed with sun and smacking air. Give me the smile, the magic kiss, to trick little boy death of my hand. I am not seaworthy. Look how the fish mistake my hair for home. Toni Morrison often chafed at being referred to as a poetic writer. Her works primarily explore and develop themes such as race, class, gender, sexuality, and age. She was political to her core and made it her mission to reveal the entirety of the Black American experience, regardless of what her fellow literary critics might have preferred. She provided insightful projection of slavery's trauma and the desperation and anguish of an enslaved mother in Beloved through depicting a recaptured enslaved mother slitting the throat of her child rather than allow them to suffer a life of bondage. She explored race, class, and gender in Sula, A Mercy, God Help the Child, and many of her other works. Yet within her works and activism, Morrison refused any ist title, and instead focused on unlimited investigation. A good man is a good thing, but there is nothing in the world better than a good, good woman. She can be your mother, your wife, your girlfriend, your sister, or somebody you work next to. Don't matter. You find one, stay there. You see a scary one, make tracks. While they are busy showing off, digging other people's graves, hanging themselves on a cross, running wild in the streets, cherries are quietly turning from green to red, oysters are suffering pearls, and children are catching right in their mouths, expecting the drops to be cold, but they're not. They are warm and smell like pineapple before they get heavier and heavier, so heavy and fast that they can't be caught one at a time. Poor swimmers have to head for shore, while strong ones wait for the lightning silver veins. Bottled green clouds sweep in, pushing the rain inland where palm trees pretend to be shocked by the wind. Although many of her works feature themes of womanhood, Morrison denied any intentions of promoting feminism. By doing so, she believed that the ideas in her works would be limited within the confines of a preset structure, such as feminism, and thus allowed no room for growth. In a 1998 interview with Zia Jaffrey about Paradise, Morrison said, I would never write any ist. In order to be as free as I possibly can, in my own imagination, I can't take positions that are closed. Everything I've ever done in the writing world has been to expand articulation rather than to close it, to open doors, sometimes not even closing the book, leaving the endings open for reinterpretation, revisitation, a little ambiguity. I detest and loathe those categories. I think it's off-putting to some readers who may feel that I'm involved in writing some kind of feminist tract. I don't subscribe to patriarchy, and I don't think it should be substituted with matriarchy. I think it's a question of equitable access and opening doors to all sorts of things. When Jaffrey commented on how her works were still associated with feminism, she replied, Yes, that doesn't happen with white male writers referring to how only women writing women are considered feminists, rather than men writing women. Morrison made it her mission to focus on breaking down barriers and exploring possibilities, rather than fitting with cultural labels. In addition to rejecting the feminist title, she championed intersectionality awareness and brought the unique struggles of women of color to the forefront. In a 2012 interview focusing on Beloved, Morrison defended Garner's decision, claiming that, While white feminists fought for the freedom to not have children, freedom for Garner was having children and being able to control them in some way, that they weren't cubs that anyone could just buy. Exploring this idea further, she continued, Womanists is what black feminists used to call themselves. Very much so. They were not the same thing. And also the relationship with men. Historically, Black women have always sheltered their men because they were out there and they were the ones who were most likely to be killed. 
As a matter of fact, this was an interesting thing for me. When I went into the publishing industry, many women talked about the difficulty they had in persuading their families to let them go to college. They educated the boys, and the girls had to struggle. It was just the opposite in the African American communities, where you educated the girls and not the boys, because the girls could always go into nurturing professions, teachers, nurses. But if you educated your men, they would go into jobs where they would have to be confronted or held down. They could never flourish easily. Now that has changed in any number of ways, but it was like an organism protecting itself. In both her activism and works, Morrison recognized that the simultaneous experiences of underrepresented groups presented a unique view of society, and that when intersectionality is not taken into account, the entire picture is lost. Someone leans near and sees the salt your eyes have shed. You wait, longing to hear words of reason, love, or play to lash or lull you toward the hollow day. Silence needs your fear, of crumbled star ash sifting down, clouding the rooms here, here. You shore up your heart to run, to stay, but no sign or design marks the narrow way. Then on your skin, a breath caresses the salt your eyes have shed. And you remember a call clear, so clear, you will never die again. Sadly, on August 5th, 2019, Toni Morrison passed away at 88 years old from complications from pneumonia at Montefiore Medical Center in New York City. She left behind her a powerful literary legacy, which blended the voices and stories of African-American women, men, children, and even ghosts in the rich, poignant world she created. On December 10th, 2020, Toni Morrison was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls, New York. And later, on December 21st, 2020, her hometown of Lorraine, Ohio, honored the late author by officially designating her birthday of February 18th as Toni Morrison Day in Ohio and signed it into law. I tore from a limb fruit that had lost its green. My hands were warmed by the heat of an apple, fire red and humming. I bit sweet power to the core. How can I say what it was like? The taste, the taste undid my eyes and led me far from the gardens planted for a child to wilderness deeper than any master's call. Now let these cool hands guide what they once caressed. Lips forget what they have kissed. My eyes now pull their light, better the summit to see. I would do it all over again, be the harbor and set the sail, loose the breeze and harness the gale, cherish the harvest of what I have been. Better the summit to scale, better the summit to be.
In this here place, we flesh, flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass. Love it, love it hard. Yonder, they do not love your flesh, they despise it. They don't love your eyes, they just as soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands. Love them. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Pat them together. Stroke them on your face because they don't love that either. You've got to love it. You. And no, they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder, out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you scream from it, they do not hear. What you put into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give you leave-ins instead. No, they don't love your mouth. You got to love it. This is flesh I'm talking about here. Flesh that needs to be loved. Feet that need to rest and to dance. Backs that need support. Shoulders that need arms, strong arms, I'm telling you. And oh, my people, out yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck unnoosed and straight. So, love your neck. Put a hand on it. Grace it. Stroke it. Hold and hold it up. And all your inside parts that they just as soon slop for hogs. You've got to love them. The dark, dark liver. Love it. Love it. And the beat and beating heart, love that too. More than eyes or feet. More than lungs that have yet to draw free air. More than your life-holding womb and your life-giving private parts. Hear me now. Love your heart. For this is the prize. <laughs>